Hey, I'm Ross Malaga. I'm the, as Carly mentioned, I'm the chair of the Information Management and Business Analytics Department here in the Feliciano School of Business at Montclair State University. I'm also affiliated with the Feliciano Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. I teach classes in both information uh, technology and entrepreneurship. Uh, what I want to talk to you today is about this concept of reopening as a wicked problem. And when you hear the term wicked problem, you might just think wicked means really hard. But actually, as you'll see in a few minutes, wicked actually has a very specific definition. It comes from uh, public policy. And that's where I'm pulling this concept of wicked problems from. So let's go ahead and, and dig into this, this idea of wicked problems. Um, I, I really like this, uh, this quote from um, Lawrence J. Peter. Some problems are so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about them. Um, and I think that's kind of where we are with the whole reopening situation, especially if you're watching uh, the news uh, on any given day, but the last maybe day or two, especially today, where we're seeing uh, many of the states that have already reopened are now having major surges. Some of them are already talking about having to shut down again or shutting down in local areas versus the entire state. Um, if you saw just a few hours ago, uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, the three governors have uh, indicated that they are going to put in place a quarantine for travelers coming in from certain states. Um, so that's where we are. The problem is so complex, we have to be intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about it. Um, and I think that's where we are. So before we get into wicked problems, let me, let me talk about tame problems. And these are the type of problems that most of us are probably familiar with, especially those in the business world. We face these tame problems all the time, so it's pretty easy for us to get a handle on them. Team problems have typically these characteristics. So first, these problems have a well-defined and stable problem statement. So a good example would be you're trying to figure out, you know, how many units of something to produce for next month, right? Or what the price point should be for the products you're selling for next month. It's pretty well-defined and stable, and it's the kind of problem that you probably encounter all the time. It has a definite stopping point. We know when the solution's reached. You've made a decision, you've implemented it, then you can see you know, in the next month whether or not your decision was correct and you can adjust from there. We can, we can objectively evaluate whether our solution was right or wrong. Did we make the correct decision? Did we purchase the right number of widgets, for example? Did we go too high or too low? All right, and it belongs to a class of similar problems that are solved in a similar way. We have heuristics or algorithms that are well known that can help us solve these problems, right? These solutions can be easily tried and abandoned. There's usually not a ton of, of repercussions or implications for the business if we get it a little bit wrong, right? If we, if we overstock one month, uh, then we just understock a little bit the next month. We might lose out a little bit on sales if we understock, for example. But again, it probably won't kill our business entirely, right? Um, and these type of problems come with a limited set of alternative solutions. The solution space is very limited. Um, we know, for example, that we're not going to be able to, um, you know, order more of our widget than is available. Uh, so we, we're, we're sort of limited in our thinking here. Um, and these are the tame problems that most business leaders deal with on a regular basis. These are the type of problems that we teach people to solve when they go to business school, whether as an undergraduate or an MBA, right? Uh, if you think about it, um, I'm going to show you just a graph here. This is the, the, the type of problem solving that we teach in business school, right? We think about gathering the data about the problem, analyzing the data, formulate a solution, implement it, and then hopefully over here somewhere, we also analyze how well we did and loop back and do it all again. Um, so these are the type of very linear team problems that we are used to in the business world. Unf 
unfortunately, right now, this is not the situation we're in. We're not in a team problem environment. We're in a wicked problem environment. So let's talk about wicked problems. All right, and again, wicked problems have a very specific definition coming out of the public policy realm. Uh, this goes back to the early 70s. Uh, and if anybody's interested, I can cite the papers and things of that nature, but I, I don't want to make this an academic presentation. I want to make this a more practical presentation, hopefully. So when we talk about wicked problems, we have sort of the same six things, but they're turned on their head. So let's go through them so everybody understands the problem space that we're talking about when we talk about wicked problems. And the first one is we don't understand a problem until we've developed a solution. And the reason for this is that every solution exposes new aspects of the problem, right? We, we, we try something and we go, oh wait, now that we've tried that, there's all this other stuff that we didn't think about, okay? Wicked problems don't have a definitive stopping rule. There's no definite solution. We don't know when we've actually solved the problem, right? That, that one right there, when you think about it, is, is really difficult. Solutions to wicked problems are not right or wrong. We can't objectively determine whether we're correct. It's not based on some formula or something that we can put our, our thumb on and say, if we just do this, we'll know whether it's right or wrong. Every wicked problem is essentially unique and novel. So the solutions need to be custom designed. We don't have any uh, algorithms or heuristics to help us with it because nobody's ever solved for this before. And every solution to a wicked problem is a one-shot operation. We really can't learn about the problem without trying solutions. And the solutions themselves may have tremendous consequences. In other words, if we get it wrong, especially in the situation we're in right now, people will die, right? So it's not just that our profits are not as much as they should be. We're really literally talking about life and death here, right? And wicked problems have no given alternative solutions. So we need creativity to devise solutions and then judgment to determine which of those solutions might be valid. So let me just be clear here that a problem doesn't have to possess all six of these characteristics in order to be wicked. So you don't have to check off all six of these necessarily. All right, and it's a balancing game. And actually check, I will use check marks in a minute, but often what you wanna think of these is a scale. So, you know, maybe some kind of like a one to five scale if you wanna really think about how wicked a problem is. Let me pause here for a second to see if you have any questions before we go on, because if there's questions about this, we need to clear them up before we can move on to anything else. Ross, I'm gonna ask the first question. If folks okay, wanna add a question to the chat, I can surface it after mine. Um, number four, every wicked problem is essentially unique and novel. So in this criteria, are we thinking of the wicked problem being coronavirus or is the wicked problem the fact that there's a challenge for different types of businesses or different business segments to actually uh, deliver their product or service? So for example, is the wicked problem for a restaurant coronavirus or is the wicked problem outdoor seating, 25% capacity? How do you distinguish? It's, it's both. I mean, obviously, as a society, we're dealing with the wicked problem of a pandemic, right? Now, is that a wicked problem unto itself? Probably not quite, because we've been through pandemics before, although it's been about 100 years since we've had something of this scale, if you go back to the 1918 flu pandemic. But there are some things we can learn from that. Um, and we've had smaller outbreaks in different countries. It's not been this this big. So in that, is, it, is, it, is this unique? I think the unique characteristic here is the fact that because of coronavirus, we shut everything down, right? And so now we have to think about how do we reopen? And again, yes, it's different for different types of businesses. Some businesses never shut down. Grocery stores, gas stations, 
they never really shut down. They, they adapted and they moved on. But now what does a restaurant do, right? And, and I know that a lot of the restaurants are struggling, right? Now you can do the outdoor seating, but the, the amount of seating they have is so small, it almost doesn't make sense for them to open up. Right, and when you go to indoor seating at 25% capacity or 50% capacity, does that make sense? So for them, they're struggling with this because they have to think about it in terms of where's my profit point? Where does it make sense for me to open, right? Uh, and other businesses will be the same, retail businesses, things of that nature, offices will need to be thinking about this. So from that perspective, yes, this is a unique problem that we've never faced before. We've never faced the, let's shut everything down or almost everything, all non-essential businesses. Um, and then let's figure out how to open them up at a time when we still have the virus circulating. Right. Follow-up question from the chat. You mentioned um, Spanish flu, influenza. Can you give us examples of other wicked problems in recent history? This is from Chad. Yes, I will in a moment. So you're about two slides ahead of me, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any other questions on this? I think that's it for now. Okay. Let me move on then so we can get to Chad's question. All right. So again, wickedness is not binary. Most big problems have some degree of wickedness. So you can think about the the normal problems in your in your own business that may have some degree of wickedness to them right again it's not binary it's not what not all the way wicked or all the way what i'm saying here is good because it's linda but um usually you're going to be somewhere in between all right and you may be maybe a little bit more towards the wicked witch of the west or the good witch of i think she was from the north um, that's what i'm going to say i've seen the movie about a million times i should know that right off the top of my head Okay, um, here again are your examples, Chad, of some wicked problems that we've we, we are we're currently dealing with, right? Um, these are these are we're dealing with them right now. Uh, climate change, we're dealing with it right now. You might have seen when was it yesterday? I think that um, there were places in Siberia above the Arctic Circle that reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit for the first time ever, right? So obviously climate change huge, huge problem, the opioid crisis, the systemic racism problem that's come to the forefront. So actually, when you think about it right now, we're not dealing with just one wicked problem. We're dealing with a whole bunch of wicked problems, but some may be more in the forefront. So obviously right now, the problem of systemic racism and the problem of reopening in a time of COVID have sort of collided with each other. Right, and, and we don't even know what the implications of that collision are right now, right? Where people are, are out in the street protesting and, and maybe that makes the pandemic worse. We don't know yet because we don't have the, the, the data yet. Um, and, and so, yeah, now we're dealing with multiple crises at the same time overlapping, right? But um, in this talk, I'm only gonna focus on one because one is enough to just focus on for, 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 for this talk. Uh, when I do um, teach this as a class, uh, sometimes to our MBA students, uh, they do take on a number of these different types of wicked problems and try to um, develop or what we call tackle them. Because the, the, one of the things you'll see in a minute is that wicked problems really can't be solved. All right, they can only be tackled. And I'll talk about what that means in a minute or two. All right. So Chad, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, we're good. Okay, let me move on then. Okay, so most business leaders never have to deal directly with wicked problems. Again, you're not being called on as a business leader to solve climate change. You may be thinking about climate change in your organization or your business and how you can impact that or you, how you can have an impact on systemic racism in your organization or your business, but nobody's going to you as a business leader and saying, Carly, I want you to come up with a solution for climate change, okay? Um, so it's something that may impact our business. We may be thinking about it, but we're not thinking about how do I really tackle it on, on, a, on a large scale. You may be tackling it on your own as a business person, in your own organization, okay? 
So the question then is, is this, a, is this reopening problem a wicked problem? So let's, let's go through it and make sure we understand whether it's wicked or not. And again, here I'm gonna use check marks, but we could also just use some kind of scale because most of these are not gonna be necessarily binary. So the first one is we don't understand the problem until we've developed a solution. And we won't know if reopening is working until we reopen. If we look around at the states that have reopened, it looks like reopening actually is looking a little bit like a failure right now because we're seeing more and more cases. Um, I think I heard today that we have more cases now than we did at the peak before we started reopening. Not, not in New Jersey, but nationwide. Okay, so we're gonna give that one a check mark. All right, we don't really understand the problem until we've developed a solution. The wicked problems have no stopping. But when are we going to be back to normal? People are talking about a new normal. What does that look like? Does that look like everybody walking around in, in large groups with no face masks? Or are we going to be wearing face masks for a really long time? Are we going to get back to a point where we're actually shaking hands? I hope not, because that was always a really bad idea. Um, and I was always opposed to it. Um, but we don't really know what, what the stopping rule is going to be. When are we gonna understand when we're quote unquote really reopened, right? Um, solutions to wicked problems are not right or wrong. So what is the correct solution? Is it 25% indoor occupancy in a restaurant? Is it 50%? Is everything six feet distance? Is it wearing masks? What is the right solution or a combination of solutions? We don't really understand that. Every wicked problem is essentially unique and novel. Nobody's really been through this before. Again, the, the closest corollary that we hear about is the 1918 pandemic. But again, that was over 100 years ago where the state of the economy and healthcare and all sorts of other things were very different than what we have now. The interconnectivity that people have, the even just things like airline travel, uh, very, very different than what we have today, right? Every solution is essentially a one-shot operation. There's really no way to test for unintended consequences until we reopen. And now that we're reopening, we're starting to see some of those unintended consequences. If we look at some of the states that are reopening, one interesting unintended consequence is the whole idea of wearing face masks. And when we reopen, we may have assumed that most people would be very responsible and we said, look, we're going to reopen. We need everybody to wear their face masks. And if everybody just does their part and, you know, keeps their social distance and wears their masks, then we should be able to reopen safely. But unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. Uh, maybe some of you saw the pictures. I live near Morristown. Um, over the weekend, there was a huge beer garden party in one of the parking lots in Morristown, uh, thrown by one of the bars in Morristown. Um, where everybody, nobody was wearing masks and everybody was right on top of each other. Um, the bar was shut down, they lost their liquor license and the, uh, the Morristown authorities cracked down on that. But again, unintended consequence of when we reopen, we think people are gonna act responsibly and they don't. And wicked problems have no given alternative solutions. In other words, the solution space is essentially unlimited. We have lots of opinions and plans we have a lot of uh, experts chiming in, and nobody was really sure. We, we're pretty sure that social distancing, mask wearing, and hand washing are all really good ideas, and we should all do them, but is that sufficient, right? Do we need other measures as well? So um, from my perspective, we are looking at reopening as a wicked problem. It checks all six of these boxes, at least to some extent. Some of these may be more or less but it does check all of these. Let me pause here to see if there's any questions or anybody has a, a thought. Maybe you wanna say that it's not wicked, that's fine. We can debate wickedness. Give folks a minute on the chat to add questions. There aren't any yet. Um, I think it's interesting. I'm a native of Boston, so we use the word wicked a lot. To know that it's rooted in a policy term from the 1970s was news to me. No, I think they took the, they took the term. They stole the term. You guys were using it probably before then. <laughs> I think they needed a term that was worse than bad or, you know, <laughs> it, 
at some point you have to have a new term to come up with something that's so big it's really hard to get your your mind around it even yeah for sure i think you can move on no questions okay. at this juncture so just to, to sum up um again characteristics of wicked problems they have many interdependencies multi-causal unintended consequences to solutions They're, they have a moving target could be unstable they tend to be socially complex. They're rarely the responsibility of just one organization. And they also typically involve changing people's behavior, which we know is really difficult to do, right? If I ask you to change your behavior, um, even on something small, chances are you won't do it. Um, I, I saw a statistic that um, when, when, when people have heart attacks, and their doctor tells them you have to change your lifestyle, stop smoking, eat healthier, right? This is literally life and death. Most people won't do it, won't make that change. Like 90% will not make that change. We're literally telling you, if you don't do this, you're going to die, and people still won't do it, right? So um, here we're, again, asking people to change behavior, put the mask on, stay six feet apart, things of that nature. And it is literally life and death for some people, and again, we're seeing a lot of people not doing that because behavior change is very, very difficult, okay? So how do we deal with wicked problems? So a couple of things that business leaders, not just business leaders, but politicians and other leaders will typically try is studying the problem. We're gonna study the problem so we really know what it is we're trying to do. The issue with this is the problem is wicked. So this approach will eventually run out of steam, right? Because the solution space is infinite. So you can, you can study it forever and never come to a consensus as what, to be, what should be done. So eventually you're just gonna run out of steam. You're gonna study it to death, but never get anywhere. So you'll spin your wheels. Um, and the other approach that is very popular is teaming the wicked. Taming the wicked. So let me get into how we tame and why it's taming is bad. All right. Um, this is a, 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 a large graphic here. So let me go through it. Again, these are just the same six issues that we've been dealing with, with on the left side. So we don't understand the problem until we've developed a solution. So what we try to do here is we try to lock down the problem definition. We try to basically say that the problem is not as bad as we, we, we want it, or, or it really is. We lock down the problem. So we see things in, in the context that we're talking about right now. It's all about testing, right? Once we get to a certain amount of testing, we'll be okay. Or, or wearing masks or staying six feet apart, okay? So we try to lock down the problem. That's the way we tame. Uh, wicked problems have no stopping rule. Well, we can just assert that the problem has been solved. And we've already seen a number of politicians doing this, saying, well, it's, it, it's going away, right? We've gotten through the worst. It's all over. Just move on with your life. Uh, or we have other people saying, well, we have enough testing so we can get back to normal now. Um, solutions to wicked problems are not right or wrong. So we team by specifying objective parameters by which to measure success. So once we get to so many tests per day, or once we get the uh, number of people infected below a certain amount, we'll basically say that's, that's um, you know, we, we've solved the problem. Um, every wicked problem is essentially unique and novel. So we can cast the problem as just like something previously, like we've made comparisons to 1918 here, but is that really a good comparison? There's definitely lessons to be learned from 1918 but we are definitely not in the same world as 1918, right? So we have to be, we have to be uh, careful about that. Um, every solution to a wicked problem is a one-shot operation. So we give up on trying to get a good solution to the problem. We just say, it's too big, I can't get my head around it. So we basically just, you know, jump to a solution that's easy. So for example, Sweden said, we're not gonna shut down. It's too hard or, or we're just gonna go a different way out. Um, I think we're in the US right now in most states, we're in the same boat where we've just said, it's too hard to keep everything shut down. So we're gonna open up, we're not gonna worry about it. 
okay? Um, I've seen this also, Carly and I, before everybody came on, we're just talking about reopening of K through 12 schools in the fall. And um, I, 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 my wife is actually a CFO of a, of a private school, and we've been having a lot of discussions about this. And a lot of the school districts are saying, this is gonna be too hard, let's just keep everybody online. We're gonna give up on trying to get a good solution because it's so difficult, right? We're, gonna, we're not gonna be creative about it. We're, gonna, we're just gonna say, just keep everybody online. That's the easiest thing to do, all right? And wicked problems have no given alternative solution. So we declare that there are just a few possible solutions and focus on selecting one of them. So again, social distancing masks, obviously a vaccine would be a solution, right? And we are, we are working um, at that, but there's no guarantee that we're gonna get that. So what happens while we're working towards that vaccine, all right? So these are some ways that we tend to tame problems. And again, we're focused here on the reopening issue, but you can think about, um, you know, have you done this for any other wicked problems that you've come across in, um, in, your, in your life or in your business career? Again, most of the time in a business world, we're not called upon to tackle wicked problems. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it would be um, rare cases, but it does happen occasionally. Okay, Carly. Ross, one question just before you switch slides. Um, on the case study of Sweden. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting one, right? Giving up on trying to get a good solution to the problem. What happens there? I mean, I remember when that news of Sweden and sort of their limitation about actually enforcing anything onto the public uh, was in the press. Do you know more about sort of how that's evolved? Like when people avoid the wicked problem, what yeah. happens? Yeah, well, in Sweden, what has happened and the, the latest in information that I saw compared Sweden with, you know, Norway, Finland, Denmark, again, the countries right around them, the Scandinavian countries, Sweden is doing much worse than the other countries that did impose restrictions and closed down parts of their economy. Actually about twice as worse, twice as bad, I guess, at least in terms of case rates, death rates, things of that nature, all the, all the measures you would think of in this context. Interesting, okay, great. No other questions in the chat at this moment. Okay, let me move on then. So wicked problems cannot be tamed. They just keep coming back or your taming makes them worse, all right? So great, now what do we do? We can't tame them. We, if, we, if we study them, we're just gonna go in circles. So is there any way that we can approach wicked problems? And what we need to do is tackle them. We can't tame them, we can't really solve them, we can tackle them. And there are four approaches to tackling them. Actually, I'm gonna combine two of them. Um, and the first one is an authoritative approach. And I would, I would say that this is the approach that we took to shutting things down. And it's kind of the approach we're taking to opening things up because it's an authoritative approach where governors made that decision, right? They reduced the number of stakeholders. They basically, the governor said, I'm in charge. I'm gonna decide to shut things down and I'm gonna decide when to open things back up. Um, they maybe didn't eliminate competing points of view. Hopefully they were listening to the health authorities in their states, the, the business leaders in their states, but they were the one in the end making that unilateral decision and they've made unilateral decisions to open back up um, and now they're making unilateral decisions about you know whether to enforce mask wearing whether to enforce social distancing whether or not to close back down again whether or not to quarantine their states as uh, new york new jersey and connecticut just did uh, from people coming in from other parts of the country um, so we we took an authoritative approach to tackling this problem early on, and we're taking an authoritative approach to reopening in, in some extent. Um, and the, the authoritative approach is not necessarily bad. We just have to understand that it eliminates competing points of view. It's often not very uh, creative in terms of the solutions it comes up with. Uh, but in an emergency, it gets, to, it gets you to a solution very quickly. And that may be really important in a, in a health emergency or something of that nature. The, the, the next way we can tackle the, the problem is a competitive approach. 
can pit, pit opposing points of view against each other, leading to more potential solutions. And I think that this is the approach we're taking, for example, with the vaccines. Um, I haven't checked in the last couple of days, but uh, last time I checked, I think worldwide, there's about uh, 10 to 12 very serious vaccine programs uh, going on right now. Uh, there's like four or five just in the United States. Uh, there's one or two serious ones in the UK. And then there's a couple in China, Russia, and a couple of other places in the world. So when you're talking about creating something like a vaccine or a therapeutic, certainly a competitive approach is a great way of doing it. Although you may want them to cooperate as well, right? Because um, there may be something that comes out of one that can uh, inform another. Right, if they're going down the same path or a similar path. Um, so the adversarial approach reduces knowledge sharing and that could hamper our efforts. So we do have this competitive approach when it comes to the vaccines, but we want to make sure that there's knowledge sharing there. Two other ways of, of tackling these wicked problems. One is collaborative and one is creative. And I would, I would say that these go together. Uh, you, you don't have to use them together, but it works really well when these do go together. So a collaborative approach would be to engage all of your stakeholders and try to find the best possible solution in that moment. Uh, the problem here is it requires a high level of participation, which might get messy. In a few minutes, I'm going to talk about stakeholders, but think about your business and all the different stakeholders involved, your employees, your customers, uh, local governments, uh, health authorities, state governments, there might be a lot of different stakeholders that might you may need to engage with, and it could get quite messy. We also want to think about a creative approach. Viewing problems from various different perspectives, or what we would call frames, helps us develop new approaches that we may not have thought about. And when we combine the collaborative and the creative, we may come up with solutions that nobody's ever thought of that may be really good ones for helping us in these wicked situations. So let me, I'm gonna do a poll right now. Which one of these does not belong? You have to choose between A, B, C, D, and E. And I'm gonna give you a minute, I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll and go ahead and choose which one of these does not belong on this screen. Is it A? B, C, D, or E. And we'll, we'll see where everybody votes and give everybody a few seconds. You know, some people who are shy, they don't want to vote. That's okay. Interesting. All right, I'm going to close this poll in about 10 seconds. So if you haven't voted, you have about 10 seconds to vote. All right, so I'm gonna share the results. This is what you said, a lot of you chose D, some A, nobody liked B, okay. Um, and then there was a, a couple of people, one for E, one for A, but C and D get all the love. Nobody loves B, I don't know why. Um, and, and the actual answer is, what? The actual answer is you're all correct. Everybody is right. Right, and you can look and see why that might be. You know, A, it's the only uh, only one with part of the shape internal, the rest of the shape. Basically, you're all correct. And and the rationale for this is that everyone sees the problem differently, and this is why you want to have that collaborative approach. Right, it's the old adage of what the people touching different parts of the elephant right? And, and they figure out that it's an elephant. Same idea, right? So if everyone sees the problem differently, everybody will bring new ideas to the table, right? So that's why you want to have this collaborative, creative approach when tackling these wicked problems. Everybody sees the problem differently. Okay. Um, I did mention stakeholders and systems. We have to deal with both of these. And this is where it's going to get even more complex. Again, so if we're going with a collaborative approach, we need to think about who our stakeholders are. 
And if we're a, a, a small, medium business, even a large business, uh, we have to think about who our customers are because we can have the best idea for reopening, right? We're gonna keep our tables 10 feet apart and we're gonna do whatever it is we need to do. But in the end, if our customers are not feeling safe, it won't matter, right? It won't matter if they're not gonna show up because they don't feel safe, it doesn't matter. Same thing with your employees. So if you put in a plan, but your employees don't feel safe, are they gonna show up? Probably not. I mean, they might have to because it's a job, but they may turn around and start looking for another job, or they may decide, you know what, these unemployment benefits are looking pretty good. I might just stay on unemployment. And I was mentioning again to Carly before this talk, um, there, you know, the, some of the um, school bus companies are having a hard time getting drivers because the drivers are making more on unemployment than they would make driving the bus. So think about that from, you know, from that perspective. Um, owners, shareholders, again, if you're, if you're in a, a company that has shareholders or multiple owners, you'll have to uh, engage with them. And then, of course, because we're in a, a time of uh, where the reopening is it, to some extent being controlled by the government, you need to understand the state and local ordinances. What are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? Um, and, and things of that nature. And there's probably other stakeholders that you might have to think about. Families of your employees, your family, your other, other situations. So there could be a lot of different stakeholders that you will need to engage in this cooperative, collaborative approach. And these are all gonna also be impacted by various systems that are around us. So a good example of this is the school system. Uh, what happens in the fall if schools are not open? What happens to your employees? Can they show up for work or do they have to stay home with their kids? What happens to your customers? Are they going to be staying home with their kids? Right? So, so you don't necessarily, school is not a system that most of us, unless you have kids in school, think about as impacting whether I can open my business or not. But in this case, it will. Think about things like mass transit. If, if your employees and or customers do not feel safe taking mass transit, and that's an important way for them to get to your business, that system is going to impact your business. Obviously, the health system is going to have an impact. If we feel like the the, the health system is overloaded and there's a ton of COVID cases, that system is going to have an impact on your business. So you have to deal with your stakeholders and systems and these are interconnected. Let me pause here for, for questions. Give folks a minute to add to the chat. If you have something, nothing at this stage, but okay. really interesting stuff. Okay. Well, this is a really smart group. I noticed some of my, my, my former students on here, so they, they already saw some of this stuff in a different context, but they probably don't remember any of it. They graduated already. All right, again, so these all interact with each other. You have many competing needs. You, as the business owner, need to understand the needs of your stakeholders and how the systems impact those needs. So keep this in mind, you know, and as these systems change, in other words, depending on the school plans, you may have to revise your reopening plan for your business, right? Depending on what's happening with mass transit, you may have to revise things because your employees can't get to your business. You might have to figure out how to get them there, right? So all sorts of, of, of things that you probably never had to think about before, now you do have to consider that in your reopening plan. Right? So the collaborative creative approach tackle the problem with this approach, communicate with stakeholders to understand their concerns, and also get ideas and input from them. Your employees and your customers probably have great ideas about how you can reopen and reopen safely. So let me go ahead and give some examples that I found in the news. Um, and these are two uh, hair salon examples. On the left is um, from a Great Clips franchisee. Great Clips is, um, a franchise hair salon. Uh, this franchisee has 46 locations in the Midwest. 
And um, they came up with this idea of the hair traffic controller to ensure social distancing, right? So this is basically a receptionist that greets people, makes sure that everybody's keeping socially distant. Somebody else came up, I guess one of the employees came up with the idea of instead of having shampoo stations, now they're hand washing stations um, and putting plexiglass check at the checkout counter. Uh, on the right is a, an actual local uh, uh, solution. This is from uh, a union, union City, New Jersey, uh, Barber on Wheels. So basically this little device here is a plexiglass divider, but your hands can go through it so you can still cut the hair, but now you can be even more distant, right? You can wear your mask, but you have this plexiglass divider. And again, an employee of this particular um, barber shop came up with this idea. So again, engaging your employees uh, would be a great way of moving forward. So again, two hair salon examples. Here's an interesting restaurant example, creative example, right? You, you think about like ugly looking screens or plexiglass, but here's a, a restaurant example that uses kind of like these really cool, nice flowing screens to divide all these tables. So the question then is, again, working with your local government, your state government, if I have these screens up, do these tables need to be six feet apart? Or could they be a little bit closer together? Can I have indoor dining if I can keep people apart with these screens, right? So again, you can, you can come up with these creative solutions that may be okay, again, in, in this environment where, again, if you understand the systems and the rules, this might work and allow you to have maybe a higher occupancy rate or a higher density rate than you normally would. Okay. Uh, this is from my hometown of Randolph and in Randolph we have a tennis center um, and they obviously could not be open indoors, uh, but they had some outdoor tennis facilities and then they expanded on that by taking over some of their parking spaces. Right, so basically they said, oh, we've got, all, we've got all this parking lot space, let's just create a tennis court in the parking lot. And so there you have it, all right? So expanding their outdoor space in a creative manner. Um, in Morristown, again, I was talking about the, the beer garden, but what they try to do in Morristown is the mayor and the restaurants wanted to close down parts of South Street to expand outdoor dining. This is South Street, for those of you who've never been there, and you can see the amount of outdoor dining space is fairly limited by the, the sidewalk. And what they wanted to do is take over parts of the actual street, close down part of the street uh, to traffic. The, the state wouldn't allow them. It's actually a state road. So the state said, no, you can't do that. Uh, instead, they came up with the idea of using parks and other uh, public spaces uh, and expanding, allowing restaurants to expand into public parks and other green spaces instead of taking over the street. It's not as ideal uh, because of the location of where a lot of the restaurants are, but it will work for some of them. Um, and this is one I just found this morning, which is hotels, right? We, we all know that um, travel has been down, right? I'm guessing most of us are not going on vacation and certainly business travel is way off. But what hotels have figured out is that people who are working from home may need a location to actually go to work from. In other words, you may have screaming kids at home, you may have a lot of other people in your home. And so basically what they are doing is renting out either hotel rooms or just work areas um, by the hour or by a block of hours. So instead of staying in the hotel overnight, uh, now you're staying, basically a lot of them are renting it out from like nine to four or eight to four during the day. Um, that allows them to clean the room, thoroughly clean the room and get guests in overnight if they need to. Uh, on the left is uh, workspaces. That's a hotel actually in New Jersey where you can rent a little workspace. It's like they're little, little, they're turning them into WeWork, right? And on the right is actually, I believe in Beverly Hills or something like that. It's a actual whole suite you get. Um, so you know, if you're looking for, you know, to upgrade your home office, you're getting tired of your little home office, maybe the one on the right is the one to go for. The, the, this, I think that one was running about five grand a day for the, for the suite. So if you really wanna go luxurious, I think the one on the left was something like $100 a day. So giving you the, the range of, of your options there. When you get tired of your home office, that is the, the range of options that you, you can look for. But these are creative solutions that uh, various different businesses and different industries 
have, have come up with in terms of reopening or still working in their business before they can even fully reopen. Okay, so, you know, thinking about that. Yeah, Carly. You want the so, one on the right, right? Is that what you're trying to, where, yeah, where, where you book that one? This is great. This is great. A couple of things I wanted to surface from the chat and also mention what you just said about co-working and finding a space to work after we've all been at home. I mentioned at the onset of this call, I'm in the university's off-campus incubator, and I had thought during this moment, co-working really wouldn't work. Yeah. In reality, a lot of people are actually looking for another space to work. It's just a matter of all um, uh, being together safely. Yeah. Um, from the chat, I just wanted to make sure you had seen that someone had mentioned that Thai Dinner Garden um, has taken over a neighboring parking lot. This is a restaurant and actually offered its patrons individual tents, which I thought was kind of an interesting cool. note. Similarly, there's a restaurant in Montclair called DeNovo that's been doing that in their parking lot. Um, but one question during your last couple of slides that is being raised by a former student of yours, is there a line between taming the problem and creative collaboration towards a solution? If the goal isn't to tame the problem, is there a collaborative approach that would tackle the problem as a whole? Yeah, I mean, there's, we, what I, I think we tend to do is, even when we're trying to tackle, because it's so difficult, we, we tend to move back into taming mode. So you want to keep that in mind, especially, you know, again, if you're doing this collaborative creative approach, you know, it's, it's always good if, if everybody you're collaborating with can understand a little bit about the concept of wicked problems and taming so that somebody is always there saying, wait, wait, we're taming this now, right? And you can kind of say, yeah, you know what, we, we, we've kind of cut off our solution space or we, you know, we, we're doing some other types of taming. So we, we tend to always come back into the taming mode. I do it all the time also. It's, it's really difficult to get yourself out of that mode. And even when you know that you're supposed to be doing something else, the tendency is always to revert back to it. So it's always good to, uh, if you have a group of people working on a solution, if they're all in tune with that concept, uh, they can all hold each other accountable uh, and, and, all, and point out when the group is moving into, into teaming versus tackling. That's great. That's helpful. I want to give you a time check. We have about 10 minutes left and encourage okay. folks to serve well, us with any questions. In the chat. That's all I have. So this is a great time for Q&A. Um, this is contact information for, my, for me and for the Montclair Center, uh, 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 Montclair Innovation Lab and the Feliciano Center. But I'd be happy to um, take any questions. I guess you don't have to necessarily put them in the chat room. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, that would be fine as well or comments, criticism, we'll take it all. Doesn't look like anybody has anything. I don't know if Carly, you wanted to wrap up and say anything else about the um, innovation lab. Sure. Um, generally not a quiet bunch, entrepreneurs and small business owners. So let this uh, uh, marinate, as they say, and come back to us if there any questions. Um, so someone had just asked, is this being recorded and will it be shared? It will be. Um, Dr. Malaga kindly is one of our first faculty members who is willing to do this in this moment for a broader audience. Um, we'll be broadcasting, essentially, or recording conversations and talks from our Montclair Innovation Lab throughout the summer into the fall. Um, so we invite you to tune in. You can tune in by visiting our website, which Dr. Malaga has up on the screen here, MontclairInnovationLab.com. Um, that actually redirects to our homepage for the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation um, on the university site. Um, you can follow us in our, at our meetup group. Uh, Montclair Entrepreneurs, which many of you are a part of. Um, we facilitate uh, one of the larger meetup communities of entrepreneurs in Northern New Jersey. Our group is about 5,600 people. So whatever we're doing on campus, off campus, in the community with partners, we will post. 
Um, and I would encourage you and invite you to stop in on us if you are with your mask and willing to come say hello in person. Um, we have a COVID-19 small business uh, photography exhibit actually up on our walls here in the center now. We have um, a variety of business pop-ups that will be with us through the summer, especially uh, when there are public events in Monkler Center. We're across from Crane Park and our hours of operation are going to be in person Monday through Thursday, 10 to four every day. Um, well, those four days of the week until uh, the fall hopefully lets us be together more. Um, but please join me in thanking Dr. Malaga and I will be posting this uh, talk to our YouTube channel. Um, and our handle for both YouTube and Twitter and others is at Feliciano Center. So if you have any trouble finding us, you can always email. There's one more form of communication here. Email at the bottom of your screen, entrepreneurs at Montclair.edu. And let me just say, I'm, I'm working on a paper on this. So if you have, if you're going through this and, and, and tackling this as a wicked problem, I'd love to hear about how you did it. Or if you have good examples, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, since I'm working on putting together a, a paper on this. So any examples you have would be greatly appreciated. And you can reach out to me at malagar at montclair.edu. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Be well and see you soon. Thanks, Carl. Thank you so much. It was great. Very good.